It's Monday Madness. Buongiorno. All right. Yep. We kind of started an intro and then I just carried on chatting. So let's get through this real intro and um, we'll see you on the other side. All right. Guten Tag. Mm, I'll have a good tug. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take long, did it? No, it didn't. We found our level straight away. Yeah, let's go in. To the hilt. Oh, it's Monday afternoon. Thanks for coming. And we're off to podium in a minute because tonight's the night where I make a complete tit of myself. So it'll be a laugh, won't it? It will be. So as long as you can keep the camera switched on and I don't say something inflammatory, like street racing is for pussies, then yeah, we'd be fine. Happy days. I know. I've come back from Alton after racing a real man sport, and I, and, I, and I won, and I was good. And so yeah, I'm just all chest, pu chest puffed out now, aren't I? So <laughs> let's have it. Right, what's going on out here? Uh, six or seven went Friday, so car park kind of looks a little bit quieter but it's still pretty rammed. Waiting on quite a lot at the minute, parts-wise. Uh, so this has come from Ireland. It's got knocking noise. The Audi dealer can't fix it in Ireland, so he's just brought it straight to us. Um, Chris was going to Spa, who's a customer of mine, so we've, I've harvested a load of bits off my Golf and a load of bits off my RS4 to sort his R8 out to go to Spa, because last week, uh, he wanted new brake lines and brake bleed and stuff like that and he'd already had a repair on a bleed nipple on a brake caliper and it just went to crap um, so we've swapped the caliper off my RS4 so um, very nice of you yeah I know I'm a nice lad yeah. I am a nice lad so we got him he went to spa he'd done his two days so we just got a, like we robbed the battery off a of golf because his lithium battery bricked it he was here till like one o'clock in the morning um, I was here late the boys done till midnight to get him sorted so yeah we're all right good work so that's come from Ireland. That RS6 looks pretty tidy, I think. It say. is mint. Yeah, yeah, Carl said it's mint as well. Um, his dad owned it from brand new. And then uh, unfortunately his dad passed away and he's owned it. It sat up for a while. It went to Audi for a leak and shock absorber and they've absolutely screwed the pooch. Uh. Um, so we need to get back to the beginning and figure out what's wrong with that. Um, this thing's in for a list of problems. So we get to the bottom of that. Uh, I can't get that to fault. Now I flashed it back to stock, but we'll see what's what. Rob's is waiting for a list of bits as well um, because that had the drive shaft come loose and smashed everything to bits. So we'll sort that. The new heads here for the RSQ3. Um, the okay. white one's getting picked up, not even getting involved. They're just going to take it away. Uh, then what have we got? Wayne's is at the front. It's got to go for MOT retest. Um, a couple of others and a dead Lambo. A dead Lambo? Dead Lambo. So should we go in and have a wander around? Do you have a look? Come on then, let's go. <laughs> Noise makes me need a wee. Uh, Captain Misery is on with Dave's. Uh, so this came from Audi, who did the brake fluid change and the pollen filter, but couldn't figure out how, how to get the under tray off because the bolt was too tight. Um, so we fixed it. Didn't we, Carl? I fixed it. Well, we, collective we. <laughs> you do the work, I pay the bills, that's how it works. I am happy to swap roles. No, didn't think you'd want that <laughs> job. <laughs> uh, so they're a nightmare anyway, because they're riv nut, they're aluminium plates with riv nuts in uh, and then steel bolts. So they get tight and then people put guns on them and spin the riv nuts. But that's what we thought was wrong with this. But it wasn't even that, was it? No. The bolt was tight. They had a go again. Yeah. And Carl had a better go again now. There we go. So new bracket, some new bolts, and it's fine. So Dave will come and get that tomorrow. But Audi also missed the offside front spring snapped enough. Nothing major then. No, not at all. It's all good fun. I like slagging people off at a minute, so let's just pile on. <laughs> but that's not this week's rant, is it? No, that's no. not this week's rant. So. Although it could be. And I normally defend dealers as well, because some of them, my friends work in dealers, they are good, but they don't help themselves. Yeah. Don't help themselves. Air guys run back to front as well, have you noticed? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what people... So if you look here, so obviously the air guide goes that way. 
you see that the blend line and the air guy is wrong. Do you see? Yeah. So you're on the wrong side. Yes, I did. And Mitchell's got the heads back on the McLaren. Cam's back on, so we're just shimming it up now. Shimmy, um, shimmy. Yep, shimmy, shimmy. Uh, so we can get it shimmed right. And then that can get buttoned up and put back in. And then I need to find a home for the Noble. So that's the next problem. I saw a lovely Noble the other day. Did you? A yellow one. Was it raining rust? No, it was no, It was a good one then. Yeah. Sweet. That's what you want in life. A car that doesn't leave itself on the road <laughs> when you move it. Uh, this one, Matt had up on a ramp and someone had pulled the threads at the side of the oil pump and done a really, really, really shocking job of trying to fix it. So we're just trying to come up with a plan on how we're going to repair that without basically putting a new oil pump on it um, because it was they're, leaking. They're a bit cakey, those oil pumps, aren't they? Yeah, I don't know, three and a half grand, something yeah. like that. But we would try and fix it. So that would be okay. Uh, Juden's on, well, I say daddy daycare, Juden died. Um, <laughs> he raced motocross yesterday. He yeah. came fifth in the first race. A few days? Yeah, yeah. That's good. But, but he was like, I'm unfit. So yeah, he raced, so he's got a CR250 and he's racing Super Evo in British Championship or something. And he's done no training, no testing, no nothing, literally from couch to bike. Yeah. And he got a fifth. I think he got six overall, I think he said. So, yeah, yeah, George's not in today, he's dead. He's having a little rest. He's died. So, that's okay. And in here, not much else has changed, mate, really. Just, we had a bit of a carnage week uh, to get a Lamborghini sorted. Um, so we had a couple of late nights. Chris's kicked us in the balls as well um, to get his ready to go for spa. And then I was away racing, so it's just one of them weeks. Open for a nice quiet week, and it was not that. You so. did expect that, to be fair. Yeah, that's okay. Um, other than that, who else have we knocked off? I... No, it's all pretty good, isn't it? Hey, the Hurricane vid did well, didn't it? It's not too bad. Yeah. yeah. So I think more buying guys. Buying guys, that was all right. Yeah, I like that. Nice, quiet one. So, I don't know, should you question corner? Should we have a look? Let's have a look. Let's do it. We're on. Oi, oi. We're on. We're back in the bay. We're on. In the bay of peaks. In front of a giant Fister. I mean Fisker. I don't even know what these are. I don't know what a Fister is. Fisker no. is. I don't know. Something Jordan's got to do, so I'll leave him crack on. Questions. I think this is from my dearest George. Um, another great video and always great vibe and energy. Ricky, you say the Hurricane is basically an R8 Gen 2. Are the maintenance costs the same or are there parts of the Hurricane that will make it more expensive to maintain? So, I, yes, servicing is the same with us to service an R8, Gen 2 or Hurricane. Same oil filter, same air filters, same spark plugs, same transmission oil, filter, front haldex, everything. The difference is, uh, same brake pads, same brake fluid, blah, blah, blah. The difference is... Uh, the front suspension is normally nose lift, so R8 don't have nose lift, so you'd have to go to Lambo for that. Rear shocks are probably the same. Uh, then you start getting into things like, um, you could probably get away with using an R8 front diff, but they're eye-wateringly expensive anyway. Calipers are obviously named, Audi, Lambo, so you're not going to swap them. Wheels, you're not going to swap them. Uh, suspension arms will be the same, so you can you can use either or. I'd have to compare prices because we don't normally get that too in depth. Uh, drive shaft should be the same. Um, what else? Where you start getting then is things like gearboxes are the same, but then they're, just, then they're software dependent. So you could buy an R8 gearbox, it would fit, it would drive, but you'll get problems in other control modules because the software is talking different language basically. So that's where it starts to get a bit funny. Um, but yeah, if you bought it and wanted an oil service or you wanted a full service with plugs and transmission, same price, whether it's an R8 or it's a, a Hurricane. Uh, and to be fair, it's the same price as, say, a facelift Gen 1 with a DCT. It's the same. It's all the same. Costs are the same, so that's fine. Dusty Jacks. Do you find spiders are more of a pain to work on than the coupes with the way the engine access works? Depends. On an R8, they're much easier because it's one panel cover that comes off and it's easy to get off. On a Hurricane, getting that panel cover off is harder. But once it is off, 
doing spark plugs is a doddle compared to a coop where you kind of have to lie over a triangle to get into it. Where it becomes very, very hard is then when it's a spider and you've got to take the engine out, that's a nightmare. So swings and roundabouts are that one, mate. Um, but yeah, it's always a coupe for me. So I wouldn't buy a spider, I'd always have a coupe. Uh, Howard Palin 67. Ricky, I follow you on YouTube and you're racing at NG and I hope you have a fantastic 24 season. Please update on Autumn Park race weekend. Ha <laughs> ha! Pole position, fastest lap, both race wins. Bosh. Boom. Holler, holler at your boy. Uh, question. Uh, you being now 40 plus, have you ever thought about racing sidecars and what are your thoughts on sidecars? I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on this, especially around the Isle of Man. Um, around the Isle of Man, I think sidecars are extremely impressive. Um, am I a fan? I might have said some unkind things about sidecars in the past, especially when they've blown up and left oil everywhere on a track I've got a race on. Um, I have been in a sidecar, both as a passenger and a driver. Uh, as a passenger, was on an old 350 two-stroke thing, and I had white knuckles by the time we'd done one lap. I have been on a 600 outfit, and that was a little bit cool. That was a little bit cooler. But to be a passenger on a sidecar, you've got to be crazy and incredibly fit. You've got to be, um, you've got to be at one with the, with the outfit. So when it moves, you move. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna try and fight it, <laughs> oh, sorry. Bless you. If you're gonna try and fight the sidecar, you're dead within three corners. As in knackered. A very good friend of mine who's no longer with us, Stan Dibbon, was a 1953 world champion on sidecars. Um, and he ran number 35 as well. Uh, and he was a Norton engineer and the then, I can't think of the bloody driver's name. So he straight away went into being a sidecar passenger with a world champion because he came to Norton to test their outfit movement and Stan's job was to lie in the outfit with a ruler and measure how much the rear wheel moved going around a lap. And that, that was it. Stan became sidecar passenger. Um, so I don't know whether his book's still on Amazon, but he wrote himself a book. Um, so he was with me when I won my championship in 2010. Wise old fox. Um, he's been gone a couple of years now, I miss him. Um, but he was, a, he was a sidecar world champion when you were fucking crazy to race bikes anyway. Their idea with a helmet was a beanie hat. <laughs> um, and there's photos of him. Do you know what? Before you put this out, remind me and I'll find a picture of him. Definitely. Shoulder down on the outfit, mate, with a, pit, with a piss pot helmet. Those guys are insane. Yeah, yeah. Fair play. Um, would I? No, ultimately. I wouldn't race outfits. If I was going to go and race something like that, I'd go and race cars. Uh, I don't like the restriction of being stuck in it. Uh, I rode, I was the driver in an outfit of Pembury and I did start finish straight with a passenger on the grass because I come out of the last turn and I was like, that's my line. And the outfit wheels on the grass. So yeah, not my bag. I've got friends who race it. I've got friends who are very, very good at it. Uh, they are impressive when they go in, but yeah, not my, not my bag, mate. It's never something I go, oh, when I give up solos, because I, I actually think they're worse because when it goes wrong on a sidecar and they flip upside down, the driver's stuck in it or the rider's stuck in it. Uh, you, you know, I've seen some nasty stuff. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, Al, Al had a bad crash a couple of years back and he ended up in hospital in a bad way, Fonzie. Um, him and his brother raced at a TT and stuff like that. So yeah, basically, if you race the Isle of Man, you're a fucking nut job. And if you race it in a sidecar, then you're definitely a nut job, but not my bag. Not my bag. Um, BGJ2940. Ricky, what's the difference, similarities between a Gen 1.5 R8 to a Gen 2? Right, so you're on about a Gen 1 facelift. Obviously, the DCT um, updated rear subframe to accommodate transmission, but is there anything else that the 1.5s and the Gen 2s have? So a, a, gen, a, a facelift Gen 1 is a Gen 1, and a Gen 2 is a completely different car. So yes, they might both have a DCT gearbox, but even they have differences. 
Um, so no, a Gen 1 does not share anything with a Gen 2, really. There's... N there, well, it's a completely different model code. One's a 4.2 and one's a 4S. So you would be very, very hard pressed to find something you could swap from one to the other. Two different, two different cars. Um, yeah, a Gen, a facelift Gen 1 and a Gen 1 pre-facelift, they're the same car, just different bits. A chassis difference for DCT or whatever. But a facelift Gen 1 with a manual is like the old Gen 1. It's a lot of Gen 1 and facelift crap, that is. <laughs> different cars. Gen 1, Gen 2, different cars. Top and bottom of it. Um, I think that is it for questions. So I will now extend my displeasure at aftermarket warranties. There we go. That is on my shit list this week. What a load of shite they are. Um, last week, I spoke to three different warranty companies for three different clients. Uh, one was a Gen 1 R8, where the illumination in the back of the binnacle had gone on one side of his dash and his centre display was missing. Um, and he had full component cover, apparently, with this company, with this warranty company. They're all called the same thing. So they're all called a different thing. And then you actually get through to the call centre and they're all the same call centres. Um, so this one at the minute we've dealt with is Assurant. Um, I don't know, based out of Gloucester. Um, and they come back and they said, he has to pay the time to take the dash out. He has to pay for the shipping of the dash to one of their test companies. One of their test companies will do a report on it and they'll try and repair it. Uh, and if they find no fault found, all the costs are down to him. If they find there's a fault, then they'll try and repair it uh, but they can't guarantee it, but they, they won't pay for a dash. Uh, and it's 1,400 quid plus that for a dash, two hours labor and coding and bits and pieces like that. So he's got a worthless bit of paper. Uh, I had Nick's in that had an oil leak and it needed, uh, it needed an oil hose and it needed the oil pump drive seals doing. And his came with a quite an extensive warranty and they paid against a three and a half grand bill, they paid 900 quid. Oof. So they turned around and said, we'll pay the labor and we'll pay the 48 pence for the seal that's leaking, but they won't pay any associated work. So they won't pay for any of the other parts. They wouldn't pay for the oil. They wouldn't pay for the coolant. They wouldn't pay for anything else. They would just pay the labor to bolt that seal onto that engine. And that was it. But I've got to take an oil pump off where there's 15 other seals and bolts and this and that. And they were like, no, we don't cover that. That's associated work. Don't cover associated work. They will just... So this is like when you used to get your house insurance and it would say, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fix the leak. Do you know what I mean? If you had a toilet leak, it would fix your carpet, but you've got to fix it. Uh, honestly, mate, it's a piss take. How they get away with it? Same company, so against a massive bill. He hadn't had this car long, so I think he's going back to talk to the selling dealer. And this is the problem. This is where this all starts from. Selling dealers or aftermarket dealers tucking customers up by selling them shit warranties to get over their liability of selling them product that they don't want to underwrite. Because if I sell a car, I have to underwrite it by law for a period of time. And I'm happy to do that. And I have, I have done that when we've helped people sell cars. I did it with the RS6 with George. Yeah, so I sold the RS6 to George. I thought I'd fixed the oil leak problem. I had that back off George. I said, look, and that was a private sale. This was more about me being a bloody good chap, if I'm honest. But I had that back and I did all the work. I put an oil pump on it and there was, he might have been, I don't think he was unhappy, but he, he had every right to be unhappy that there was a problem with his new car. But he completely understood that I dropped another three grand on it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and then the other one, what was the other one? Uh, th th we're dealing with a McLaren. So they've turned around now and they've gone, ah, well, it's a valve stem seal, so we're, we're not sure how we're going to deal with that. And I'm like, well, you need to tell me how to deal with it. Well, yeah, because it's wear and tear. No, not 28,000 miles it isn't. Do you know what I mean? It's not the customer's fault. There's nothing he could have done. He hasn't driven a pothole and smashed his wheel or not maintained his car or, do you know what I mean? Sprayed it in battery acid. This is a something's wrong with this car that he has got a warranty for. And they're just being knobs. You have to run round, you have to phone. There's, you just, honestly, it's, they're such a nightmare and so hard to deal with. Um, 
And then we had James, James O'Keefe, his name was. He bought a car, not the best one. We give him a pretty extensive list. Uh, we spoke to the warranty company uh, and they are, they've are they literally turned around and said, yeah, we'll look at him, look at his cases on a case-by-case -case basis. They wouldn't do it as a package, like I'd found a load of problems. He won't get anything out of him for that, I'm telling you now. Uh, he's got a £1,000 limit per claim, including VAT, right? So the first one is a massive oil leak and like not even like the parts of that. Um, but the problem is he has to underwrite the work. So they say, yeah, no worries, get it stripped apart. They, you, you have to pay for diagnosis work. So get it stripped apart uh, and then we'll assess whether your claim is valid or not. So he's got a thousand pound per claim and then he's got max number of claims. So it's like, what's the, what's the point? That works on a Golf. It don't work on a supercar. Do you know what I mean? So they're a Swiss. They're a Swiss designed to allow shitty dealers to sell shitty cars and not have the problem legally that they've absolutely tucked someone up with a heap. Now, I'm not saying that's all because we've seen some cars with warranties on that are lovely cars and they've been sold well. They just have a problem. But the warranty companies are absolute dross. They're the same ambulance chasing PPI crap that like this diesel gate scam is. They're the same people. Oh, yes, we need to speak to our engineer about that. And that engineer couldn't crash his way through a college course of how to put a car together. They're just sat there. They literally, you, ha you cannot use the word, oh, why do you think that oil leak is? So say oil feed hose. You cannot say corroded, don't cover corrosion. You cannot say due to age, don't cover wear and tear, or age, right? So you've literally got to find a way to needle it through. Cannot say damper, don't cover dampers, right? Honestly, they sit there and they've literally got their little flip book of scripts to work through. The only warranty I would recommend anyone buy is genuine, is Audi warranty, right? And I looked before I came on it. So I, I used a, a client's car, I used Mark's car, his registration, 2010 Reg R8 on 35,000 miles, right? I've gone for full comprehensive cover, so that's a full component protection with a 250 pound excess and that's 2,088 pound a year. So that's 200 odd quid a month if you break it down. If you're not going to go to Audi, now we can't do Audi warranty. You have to go to Audi for that. Um, we can do all the other motor claims, all the other policies is fine. This is the other thing. They'll pay £60 an hour. That's the most I've ever been paid, £60 an hour. I'm not because I have to charge the customer. The customer underwrites what the warranty company won't pay for. So even if you get them to pay the claim, or even if you get them to pay the 48 pence O-ring, they ain't covering the labour costs. Yeah? Who the hell works for £60 an hour in a motor trailer anymore? And people are paying a lot of money for these. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Yeah. So, when you get your worthless Wonka ticket, a few things to check. Because if, if it don't check it, I wouldn't even waste your time on it. Max claim. So, max value per claim. How much money can you claim on? Because a transmission in an R8, in a DCT or Huracan, is 35 grand to start with. So, if you've got a five grand claim... Pfft, Anything running gears out done. How many claims? How many, the max number of claims? So how? What's the max number of claims you can have? What's the labour rate? It doesn't matter what you do. You're always going to have to cover off the diagnosis. Maybe not necessarily at, at, at dealer level. They should normally help you out there, but don't be surprised if they don't. Can be dealer to dealer. We don't charge diagnosis if we repair the vehicle. If we diagnose it for you and you take it somewhere else, no matter what it is, we charge a diagnosis. But if you come in for us and you're like, Rick, it's got a noise, the diagnosis time's on us, essentially. And I've always done it the same way. Um, if I'm hunting for a problem and it's really, really extensive, then yeah, all right, we might have to charge, we might have to charge a, a, a bit to sort of help cover it off. It, it, it's case by case. So if it's manufacturer approved warranty and you're backed by the manufacturer, um, then you have to go to the manufacturer to get the warranty work done because they hold the purse strings. So what I would do there is just be very, very careful when you buy these aftermarket ones. Now, I looked at doing my own um, because uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to offer this to clients and I am still quite keen to do it 
and underwriting it myself because I looked at having a warranty company come in to underwrite it for me and it was pointless. It was no point me going through the rigmarole of doing it. There was no money in it. So I was looking at doing an RE performance warranty, getting you in, putting you through a pre-warranty inspection, like a PPI, so we could identify everything wrong with the car and then going, right, you get a year's warranty off us from now, excluding what we found essentially so if i find a leaking damper i'm not obviously not going to warrant that damper now i'm well up for that but the problem is is i need for me to underwrite it i need a big jump of people to come on board because if you drive to the bottom of the road after you've paid for your warranty and your engine goes rattle rattle bang and i've got to put a new engine in your car and i've only sold one warranty do you see what i mean the scale's wrong so it is something i've spoken about it is something people have asked me about i just don't know the best business case to put it together but just be very, very careful with these tuppence warrant. Honestly, you'd be better off writing on the back of a fucking Kellogg's packet because they're worthless. They're genuinely worthless. I have not seen one aftermarket warranty company and we don't take, we don't take everything we've claimed for is genuine. They can come here and they can look at it, right? I've got a customer who, who uh, we put a front diff and a heater valve on an R8. The front diff was noisy recorded the noise everything and he was like rick i need my car back and it needed a heater valve so the heat of them was stuck on a hundred percent right and we were going through the warranty company and they said yeah it's with this it's with that we ordered the parts in and the customer went rick fit the parts i'll pay for it and the warranty company can pay me back told the co- warranty company that you've broken procedure we're not paying out that's it six grand so he's had to go to the abundance now and fight them because they're saying because they were contemplating the, ca- the claim, it was their decision whether the car got repaired or not. The fact that it was sat here doing nothing, customer was like, oh, I need my car back. So he paid, it's done, car's fixed, everything's sorted, parts are up there at the top. And the warranty company like, oh no, because you've broken procedure, we might have wanted to come out and inspect the car and tested that you fit the right parts. Because you've broken procedure, I'm not paying the claim. They will look for anything, anything to get out of the claim. My honest reaction is to any of these aftermarket companies, don't waste your money. Don't waste your money. 200 quid, 200 pounds a month. What's that? I'm, what is 50 quid a week? What's 50 quid a week these days? A couple of visits to Costa or do, 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 do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh... Uh, it, it's hard for me to sit here and say you don't need a warranty because it's like a builder fixing his own house. Do you know what I mean? I can fix my own car, it's just parts. If you have to have a warranty, my advice is go manufacturer. I think part of it is also going back to sort of magazines. Whenever there was a review of a car that, okay, was seen as potentially a bit of a risk. Yeah. So whether it be a Maserati, an Alfa Romeo, or something like that, something Italian, traditionally, if there was a used car guide in Evo, they'd say, make sure you take out the extended warranty to cover you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think people just thought, oh yeah, well that, that's, yeah. that's gonna fix everything. And, and this is the other thing as well. So I just went up now and I just typed into Google, uh, Audi extended warranty, because I wanted, I know what the page looks like. It is seventh in the rankings. Audi extended warranty, genuine Audi extended warranty is seventh, right? Every, all six in front of that are these aftermarket companies selling Audi extended warranties who pump the SEO. So you've got to be careful what you end up signing up for. My young, going off a topic slightly, my younger, uh, my eldest, Callum, being a young man, thinking he knows the world, applied for his license and he's like, no, I'll do it. So he sat there, applied for his license and applied for his license through one of these external companies that do it for you. So I'm like, oh, how much was you? He, he paid on my card and it came up on my phone. He paid 128 quid or whatever it was. And I'm like, mate, what have you done? For your provisional. For your, for your provisional. I'm like, it's like 50 quid for your license. He's like, oh yeah, I've done that. I've gone onto it. He's typed in, get my license or DVR license or whatever sure. it is. The first thing that's popped up is, he's com- is one of these companies that goes in and charges you a fee to apply for your license for you. So then he's obviously upset that he spent money because at first I was like, have we been scammed here? Yeah, you think. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, we sorted it out. But there's companies out there, like those as well, that are there to just swizz you out your money. It's the same with passports. 
Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You need yeah. to update your passport. Yeah. They're the ones that come up first. Yeah, before, yeah, yeah. Before yeah. The, the, you know, the, the, the government. Because they drive website. the SEO or they drive the traffic. They drive the search results. Uh, honestly, all these aftermarket warranties, I'd love to hear if anyone's had a positive experience. And if you have had a positive experience, put the company below you've had a good experience with. It does, there's a caveat to that. The value that the claim was. Um, but my honest advice is do not waste your money on that fag paper and go and buy a manufacturer warranty. If you need that protection, then go and buy a manufacturer warranty. Do not waste your money because at the end of the day, they're PPI salesmen. It's an insurance policy. That's what you're buying. And that insurance policy is run by a guy who is looking out to screw you out with that money. He's not interested in your car. He has no affiliation with the brand. They're not trying to keep product on the road. They're not trying to look after it. They're literally trying to take your money off your monthly and when you need them, squeeze your tip. So I have zero patience for aftermarket warranties. I have not found a good one. I would not recommend a good one. It's aftermarket. It's a genuine manufacturer warranty or nothing. And I'm not saying they're perfect. Sure. I've had clients who have struggled with those as well, but that's mainly dealer problems. Dealers not being able to diagnose it. But all these motor claims or motor warranty or auto warranty or warranty wise and all this crap, load of bollocks. Don't waste your money. I think the, the other thing to, to throw in there is, you know, spend the time getting, like, finding the best possible car you can and get it yep. expected. Yep. And this then goes back to, look at the product we work on. If it's a choice between buying a 30 grand R8 and possibly having to spend 10 grand on it or buying a 40 grand R8, that's a better car. Buy the better car. Yeah. Yeah. Wise words, mate. I like to think so. So, I think that's uh, us covered. Yeah. Yeah. No point, you know, no point going dating and picking an ugly person, spending 10 grand on plastic surgery when you could have just gone out of a fit person <laughs> in his first place, isn't it? I like that analogy. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, just, just, it's because I think people think they're protected because. 99 times out of 100, they don't need it. Oh, my warranty's expired. The day you need it, well, let me tell you this now. The ones who needed it last, I've, I've never had a car, I've never gone, right, it needs oil pump seals. That's the work, that's the cost. Oh, look, I've received the right amount of money. Never received that. It's always a squeeze. They always squeeze it out. And like I said, on Nick's, they literally paid for my labor to take the oil pump on and off and the one seal. Well, what about all this stuff I need? Oh, yeah, that's consequential. Don't pay for any of that. It's the same. Yep. So what about the oil that needs to go in it? No, that's down to customer. What about the coolant that needs to go back in it? Because the oil pump carries the water pump as well. That's down to customer. Yeah. Right, so I think you should go and brew up. No, I think we should have a cup of tea. Yeah. All right. Thanks. But if there are good ones, as <laughs> a challenge, then list them up. But like I said, if you're gonna list a name that's done well by you, tell us what the claim value was. Because if it's 40 quid, I bet they jumped at paying that. I bet. I bet. I bet. I bet. Uh, so, oh, I've said so. Uh, a, good, a good friend of mine, and he, he supports me a lot as well. So Alan Gardner, who runs OMG, who obviously his team built my R6 and then we built his R8. Uh, he bravely came out last year um, and said he had prostate cancer. Um, he's been through surgery, he's on the mend, he's doing well, um, but he has linked up with a guy called Harvey and they're fundraising. Alan's not doing a ride, but these other guys are doing a ride. Uh, and they asked me if we'd get involved as well and especially use the channel to try and help promote it. But basically, Harvey and three of his mates are riding uh, some Triumphs, literally to Gibraltar and back, uh, to raise money for uh, Prostate Cancer UK and AirAbility. They're all air traffic controllers. So what they're basically doing is visiting like 24, yeah, 24 air traffic controller sites. Um, but they're raising money for two charities and one of them is obviously close to us with Alan. Um, so I said we would do everything we can to try and help them raise money and get their goals. Now, it is a big deal. Triumph are involved. OMG are involved. I mean, Arai are involved. You know, 
some big companies are backing them. They've been trying for giving them four bikes to do it on. Um, you know, they've been given gear and stuff like that to do to try and help raise money. So if you could go and have a look. So the website's on Instagram. It's the Big Tour 24 and 24. Website is 24in24.co.uk. So they're essentially doing it in 20, 24 days, I think it is. It's hard going. Not 24 days. Day one's 14th of April. Day seven, to, yeah, seven, 17 days. So they're doing 20, they're doing 24 national sites. Um, but you can go and ride with them. So if you follow social media and you ride motorbikes, you can go and do stints with them um, and do different stints. So go and have a look for me. Uh, like I said, with Alan, and Alan is mint, he's lovely. He, he is not a BSB team boss because I've worked for some of them and they're horrible. Um, but Alan's mint. Um, so with everything he's gone through and how lovely it is, it just is my way of trying to sort of show the love. Um, Chase, Dom from Chasing the Racing is involved. You, you know, just everybody who's been around Alan is just trying to help. So go and have a look. Harvey's mint as well. He came down, he hung around while we were doing a Skyline video, didn't he? he did. Sat drinking tea, watching the misery that goes on behind the videos <laughs> he watches. Um, so yeah, it was good. But um, it's, the, it's the, behind suicide, it's the biggest killer of men. So anything you can do, anything you can donate, or even if you can just go and ride with them and support them to get them through it, then I'd love you forever. Good man. All right. So we'll put the links below. Below. Dav will put it all in there. So just have a little look. If you, if you can't give, that's fine. But just keep an eye, spread the word out. Because um, I think now more and more people, it's affecting more and more, isn't it? I think everybody knows someone now, don't they? Um, so go and have a look and good luck to them. It should be, it sounds a, sounds a cool trip. It sounds hard work, but it sounds a cool trip. So. Lovely.